Hey, speak for yourself, listeners. Before we start the show, I wanted to tell you about our brand new Fox Sports app and website, foxsports.com. Reimagine for the modern sports fan. Go ahead, download the new app now. You don't even have to pause this episode. Every day on the new app and website, you'll see the top stories in sports, plus a rich world of written content, videos, social media, and analytics to give you a 360-degree view of the most important stories of the day. Streaming live TV has never been so easy or elegant. Every Fox Sports game, including all pregame and postgame shows, are just one click away. For the extra invested fan, we also go deep with real-time wagering lines, trending prop bets, win probability, and key player projections. So download the new Fox Sports app or visit www.foxsports.com. Now, let's start the show. Welcome to Speak for Yourself, Marcel Swiley, Emmanuel Acho. My brother. Yeah, hey man, we got to get into this. Forget how we look right now. Let's get it started with some breaking news in Philadelphia where the Eagles are hiring Nick Sirianni as their next head coach, according to multiple reports. Sirianni spent the last three seasons as the Colts' offensive coordinator. He's replacing Doug Peterson, who was fired earlier this month after finishing last in the NFC East with a 4-11-1 record. So, Acho, what was your reaction to the Eagles hiring Sirianni as the head coach? I got a lot to get off my chest. Let me preface with this, big oh, bro. What are we going here? You can be unqualified and still succeed. The two are not mutually exclusive. You can be unqualified. Uh, I heard it. And still succeed. And now I feel it. (laughs) Let's go ahead and get that out the way. Just because someone succeeds does not mean they were qualified to be hired. Nick Sirianni wasn't qualified to get this gig. He wasn't. Let me make this clear for all of y'all. The Eagles fired Doug Peterson to hire his understudies understudy. All right. <laughs> the Eagles uh, hired I mean, Doug Peterson yeah. to hire his OC's <laughs> offensive coordinator. Somebody mm. got to make that make sense for me, Marcellus. I'm here. I don't get this high. Actually, I do get it. I didn't want to be honest with y'all because <laughs> in playing for the Eagles, I'm not allowed to tell y'all 100% of the truth. Ooh. You know what I'm saying? When you're in a locker room, you can't say everything, but it's about time to say some things. Mm. What we know about Eagles management is this. They want to be able to control the situation. Mm. Doug Peterson is no longer the Eagles head coach, not because they struggled Mm. this year, contrary to what y'all read. He's no longer the Eagles head coach because management wanted to tell Doug Peterson who to hire and who to fire. And Doug Peterson looking at himself saying, look, I've won Super Bowls. Y'all not going to tell me what to do. But you know who Eagles management can control? They can control a coach with no head coaching experience. They can control a coach with a limited resume. They can control a coach with a minimal name. So it's not like he's coming in to call a whole bunch of shots. So when I look at it, I say this. I believe the Eagles just hired a puppet that management can control. Now, I'm not going to say a puppet can't succeed. I'm not going to say Nick Sirianni can't have success. I'm not going to say he won't have success. But just because you have success does not mean you were necessarily qualified for the job at the moment in which you were hired. Oh, you got there. Uh, You went exactly where my notes were taking me as well. My reaction to this was somewhere between surprised and shocked. Mm -hmm. Um, I was surprised because I looked at the qualifications and I said, that's an interesting hire when we didn't hear about him being in the front of the line for other opportunities. Um, But it stopped short of shock because once I see offensive coordinator on your resume, You are deemed qualified because the only next step is a head coaching opportunity. Now, shame on the media. Shame on us for not pumping him up based on the accolades. What accolades? Oh, uh, having an offense that was 30th ranked before you got there. And then your three years, they're eighth ranked. Um, That's pretty good, Uh, especially when you had a carousel of quarterbacks. Uh, We go all the way. Andrew Luck. We go to Jacoby Brissett. Then Phillip Rivers, who was broken down to the point where he was available to be there. Eighth ranked based on what metrics, sir? um, Points. Yeah. I'm like, I don't see. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Hey, man. I know this just hit right now and prep is different for both of us, but I'm I'm just letting you know what the numbers say right here. (laughs) All I'm saying is that's a pretty big leap. So I wasn't shocked. Second thing is, Acho, be real. Talk to me. Once Doug Peterson was fired, and you went to the place why he was fired, yes, but you didn't say it with your chest because you said, ah, I'm with the Eagles and I can't say it 100%. Can't say everything. I wasn't with the Eagles. I can. <laughs> I don't serve two gods. Uh, I work for Fox. And guess what? I'm about to talk this talk. And talk speak, that talk, speak bro. Speak for yourself. I knew that they were going to hire a coach that they wanted 
in part to have less power and a shorter leash. Mm -hmm. Why? Because they pumped Doug Peterson. They were basically telling Doug Peterson who to hire and more importantly, who to play. That whole carousel between Jake, Jalen Hurts and Carson Wentz and how that whole season played out, that wasn't all Doug Peterson's doing. Of course not. So when you want to call Nick a puppet, you just replaced a puppet mm -hmm. in some respects. Hey. I know you got a Super Bowl on your resume, but still, it's how you went out. And you went out not on your own sword. So I look at this situation in short and say this. If they did that to Doug Peterson, the next best thing in terms of who's going to replace him is going to be someone with less power, yep. shorter leash, and who was the best for Carson Wentz before? Because you got to make your money work. You got to get a return like, on I, I investment. I understand what you're saying. Come on. I understand like, what you're I'm saying. not saying he's better than Jalen Hurts because you know of I course, think Jalen Hurts is better. But the point is, there's still too much money invested in Carson Wentz. We need to fix Carson Wentz. So the organization says, let's minimize the head coach in terms of him being involved in office politics, bringing himself upstairs all the time, trying to work with our dealings. Two, who's the best to fix Carson Wentz? Frank Reich. Damn it, we can't get Frank Reich. Who can we get? The same guy who Frank Reich. Frank Reich has been on record saying, I think he's a brilliant offensive mind. The first thing I said to general manager Chris Ballard was, that's the guy I need in Nick Sirianni on my staff. Same guy who's went from 30th to 8th. He's a tireless worker. He pays attention to details, dynamic coach and personality. The first hire that Frank Reich wanted was Nick. So if you look at this in totality, brother, I'm not shocked. And I'm a little surprised just because I didn't hear enough of his name. But shame on me more so than shame on Nick Sirianni. I, I don't know shame on you, big dog. Well, first, let me no, push back no on a couple on things. Me. Let I, me push back on a couple things. Okay, let's go. Um, the first is they had the 30th ranked offense because Andrew Luck didn't play that season. We hey, all know that. Hey, man. Right? Now, the next, year, crook. the next year, as I see it, they got the 10th ranked offense followed by the 18th ranked offense followed by this year the 10th ranked offense. Now, again, I trust you. I trust your preparation. But the numbers I see are a little bit different, so I just got to push back on what I oh, see. I'm but let's get more. Tell us to the detail that don't nobody want to talk about, and I'm going to say it. I hate in sports where we just take lazy narratives, and I'm guilty of it. Ah, uh, Nick Saban failed in the NFL until I did my own research, and I was like, wait a second. Nick Saban's first year with the Dolphins, he won nine games. The Dolphins have only seen head coaches win nine games four times in their last 17 years. The next year when Saban struggled, his starting quarterback got hurt. So did he really fail? Or did I just listen to what everybody else said? Okay, why am I bringing that up? Because Frank Wright, we all say that Carson Wentz succeeded. Carson Wentz succeeded because of Frank Wright. And yes, that played a factor, but all the dudes I talked to who were on that Super Bowl roster told me Frank Wright didn't call the plays. Frank Wright would get on the headset. He would tell Doug Peterson about three or so plays to call in mm -hmm. third and short or on the mm -hmm. goal line, and Doug Peterson would call the plays. Okay. So was it that Frank With Wright that. is the biggest reason for Carson Wentz's success, or was it a 27-year-old Zach Ertz, a 27-year-old Alshon Jeffrey, a 28-year-old Torrey Smith, a 24-year-old Nelson Aguilar, first-round pick who was in his best season, although he caught a lot of slack while in Philly? Hmm, was it Frank Wright? Or was it a combination of a bunch of other players in the prime of their career? Because what's frustrating me now, Marcellus, is like, wait a second, I have Frank Wright's number, so put me in the head coaching conversation. Like, just because you were associated, oh, do just because you were associated to a man who was associated with Carson Wentz's prime, doesn't mean that you should all of a sudden be a first candidate for a job, Sal. That's where I get lost. Like, Nick, Nick uh, Sirianni, the only reason that we're kind of tolerating this head coaching hire Tolerate. is because he's associated with the man who was associated with Carson Wentz's success. That's not it. That's I, it. That's I, it. <laughs> then what is it? I, I give it, I, I could break it down. First please. of all, let me push back on your pushback. Please, because please, when please, you push on me and I weigh more than you, I'm going to push back and it's going to hurt you. <laughs> no, no. Points per game. Year before Sirianni, 30th. Under Sirianni, Got you. Eighth. You're going off points. Okay. Okay. Yards per game. Let's keep going. 31st to 14th. Huge drop. Rushing yards per game, 22nd to 10th. These are all drastic improvements. Passing yards per game, 30th to 13th. Reset to luck, though. Hey, hey, I, I, that, that has to matter. That no, has to matter to you. It will. Okay, so I could drop you a couple notches. But it doesn't matter. That's still a huge drop. And let's still get turnover. You're teaching a new quarterback every year the same system, but it's a different quarterback, and you're still drastically improving. Well, however you want to slice the big dog, he had impact. Let's talk about third down percentage. Money down, 18th to 6th. Three different quarterbacks. Let's talk about sacks. You were the worst team in terms of allowing sacks. When you left, now you're left, 
Second fewest. Here's the thing. Let's talk about who he is. Because I'm going to go to the guy who I think is going to be a Hall of Famer and Phillip Rivers. Okay. Phillip Rivers was considered broken by many people his last year with the L.A. Chargers, correct? Okay. Yes, sir. 23 touchdowns, 20 interceptions. Yes, sir. Phillip Rivers threw 20 interceptions. Yes, he did. But uh, when you look at that, you're like, where's Phillip Rivers going to go? He lands at Indy. He lands where Nick Sirianni is. He lands where Frank Reich is. All of a sudden, Phillip Rivers goes to 24 and 11. A lot of people say a tremendous season by... Philip Rivers, tremendous season by the Indianapolis Colts based on all expectations. You can't just keep giving credit to individuals and not give it to the total or to the person who is in charge of the offense. And that's why we I'm to, not shocked by Nick Sirianni. We got to park route. somewhere. We got to park somewhere because I'm well, confused. Well, let's ride first. <laughs> <laughs> let's go somewhere I'm first. I'm confused. And I'm sure y'all at home are confused too because oh. how do we dictate when we give the offensive coordinator credit if he's not calling plays, and when we give the head coach credit, if he is calling plays. Because we look at Doug Peterson and Frank Wright. I know how. And some people have said, well, you know what? Let's give Frank Wright credit, even though Frank Wright wasn't calling the plays for that Eagle Super Bowl team, Doug Peterson was. Well, then we look at the Chiefs, and we don't give Eric Bieniemy any credit. We give Andy Reid all the credit, because Andy Reid is the play caller, not I Eric Bieniemy. But then we go, it's how long it take you to get but to then, where you No, really I'm not even go. going. I'm, that's not where I want oh, to go. Okay. But well, then, we go to, then we go to the Colts. Let's go. And now we're going to give Nick Sirianni credit, even though Nick Sirianni's not calling the plays, but Frank Wright is. I just don't know how we're allowed to pick and choose when we want to give oh, non-play oh, callers oh, oh, credit. Oh, well, one, if you own a team... If you own anything in this world, as you own some things, I know your properties, your IP is out there, um, you can do what the hell you want to do. So let's not go into somebody else's lane and tell them what they can't do. Talking about management. Talking, talking about Eagles talking management. About, talking about who hired Nick Sirianni. Okay. <laughs> so let's not go that far. Acho, I love you to death. You come over to my house trying to tell me how I'm going to run my house, you're going to be gone. It's just going to be that simple. <laughs> and I'll call you later and talk about it. It's that simple. But here, scheme, schematics. Is different than play calling. Let's Correct. just be real about Correct. that. We've been in the locker room before. We've been on the sidelines before. I was on the sidelines with a head coach that was a winning head coach, didn't even wear a headset. His name is Wade Phillips. Wade Phillips has a tremendous win percentage in this league. People try to slight him and say he's only a defensive coordinator. Look up the numbers. He has a winning percentage that show everywhere he went as a head coach, he did a little something. Point being, during the game, Wade Phillips sitting there looking at us like, y'all prepared. Like the game is played Monday through Saturday to Wade Phillips, and on Sunday, I let my coordinators coordinate. Mm -hmm. That was his style. I've also played with coaches like Bill Parcells and everybody else. You better run it through me. Marty Schottenheimer, run it through me. Mm -hmm. In that respect. So they're all different, one. Two, this situation, man, if you look at what his resume says, it says enough to get him the opportunity. It gets him enough. No, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I really don't under... I'm really... You know what? Let explain me explain your frustration. Let me explain my frustration. Because frustration means you want something else. Yes. Let me explain. Anger means you want something else. You don't want Nick Sirianni. What did you want? Let me explain my frustration. Because I'm not frustrated. When I look at a hire um, like Robert Sala, Robert Sala had a top six defense the last two years, and this past year, he had none of his dogs, and he called his own place. When I look at a uh, hire like the coordinator Staley from the Rams, the number one defense this year in points and yards, and he was the coordinator who called his own plays. Now I look at Nick Sirianni. This year, number eight in yards, number 10 in points. So however you want to decide how you rank your offense, he's mm -hmm. number eight in yards, he's number 10 in points. He didn't call his own plays. Last year, number 25, 25th best offense in yards, 18th best offense in points. He didn't call his plays. The year before, Seventh in yards, tenth in points. He didn't call his plays. So, Seth, I'm if, trusting you that he didn't call his plays. That, that, I that's based there. on all the reports. That's based okay, on all the reports. I'm just trusting right. you. Correct. And I'm trusting the reporters. And, and, and we're trusting the reporters. We, we all trust okay, somebody. I'm just here. trusting it. So, when you say, what's my frustration? Yeah, what's your frustration? If, 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 if Nick Sirianni is qualified, then there were people way more qualified Names than him. The numbers. I don't even have to. As soon as you say Eric Bieniemy, it becomes racial. So I don't even want to no, talk about Eric Bieniemy. If it, if but, it's, if it is, it is. is if you, if like you want to talk about qualifications, you got coordinators that are still in these playoffs right now. But what's the issue? The issue is Eagles management needs a puppet. Bro, mm. let's go relationships, big dog. 
What I've learned is this, um, and, and you know this, you married, I'm single, I'm the single one out here in these streets. Uh, what I've learned, <laughs> yes, you what, what I've learned, Cell, is this. The older an individual is that you go on a date with, they're already set in their ways. Mm. They've lived a lot. You they date know. them old ladies? <laughs> you, <laughs> don't be laughing. Oh, We're dog. talking sports. We got, <laughs> no, you brought up relationships. You out there in them streets, Metamucilin. <laughs> you better get your game right. All right you Look, big dog. Oh, the oh, older man. it is somebody you talk to, they set in their oh, ways. They stuck. They stuck. stuck. They stuck. <laughs> but the younger you go, ah, they're a little more pliable. Like, they're a little more open. They're a little more, you know, okay, I can go this way, I can go that way. It's the same thing with head coaches. The older the head coach, the more seasoned the resume of a head coach, you're not going to tell me who to hire. You're not going to tell me. Right, that's why Doug is gone. It, exactly. So what does so that have to do me, with Nick? That has to do with Nick because it, it, Nick is just going to be a puppet. Well, because well, Nick uh, Doug, young. Doug was a puppet. Doug no, did, Doug was not a puppet. Hold on. Did Doug, Doug get his way? Doug was not, he got fired. Did he get his way? Listen, no, because he got you, fired. You know why he didn't get his way? Because he, he, he played both sides. He played both sides. You know he played both sides. So, first of all, Doug Peterson out there with Carson Wentz, they had a fractured relationship. Correct. They tried to mend it, right? Yes, sir. Okay, so already we got an issue there. Then Jalen Hurts, they draft him. And were you with Jalen Hurts or against Jalen Hurts? Mm, pins on the day. Pins on the wind. Then all of a sudden, that insertion of Jalen Hurts into the starting lineup. And then after that, you're like, are you with Jalen Hurts or are you with Carson Wentz? He's saying what the political speak was. He was talking for the organization. Meanwhile, beefing with the same organization he was trying to make smooth with. Finally, he just got to a point where he's like, y'all can't tell me who to fire and who to hire. And then he left. He went out finally saying what he felt, but his entire tenure after the Super Bowl with the losing record was him trying to make it happy over here. My grandma used to say this, you got two hands. Mm -hmm. One of them is rubbing and one of them is petting. He was trying to rub the situation on the field with the players and then he was trying to pet the situation upstairs. You got to pick a side, big dog, and he picked a side. That's why he's out. Opportunity for Nick Sirianni. Let me give you this, Acho, because I love to personalize it because we go example, example, relationship, relationship. I don't know these old women you date, but I do know Acho. Be real, Acho. Yes, sir. Were you the most qualified person for this job? Damn no! I know you. Uh, no, no, no. Was I the most skilled? No, you know, you, you, I, 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 whatever you want. Whatever you want. Patience. Under. I'm gonna say it again. Were you the most qualified? Under that is skill, if, if, talent, if, attributes, and all if, that. If qualifications is talent, I would say yes. If no, qualification no, no, no. is uh, NFL resume, uh, I would say uh, no. Uh, hey, hey, I just want you to understand. None of, look, when I when I retired, I retired, and I wasn't the best DN ever. I probably wasn't the most qualified. But you add all the things up. You add up relationships. You add up associations. You add up what you had in terms of impact on resume. Acho, all of a sudden you add up Acho, he's here. But if you just look at it like, man, what did he do? He played in the league four years. What, then you look at me. Mark says, what did he do? He played in the league 10 years, and he had no sacks a few years. Like, you can beat up every resume. Do you hire number one all the time? No, no you don't. No. So why are you so frustrated at this I'm one? I'm frustrated because it depends on what you deem as a proper qualification when making a hire. So if you want to talk personal. Oh, officer coordinator. Yes. Well, if you want, let, okay. let's talk oh, here. Let's go here. Let's go here, let's then go. let's get to back to sports. Oh, let's go. If you want to base a qualification for a TV host based on the name brand, based on how he played on the field, absolutely not. I am the least qualified. But if you want to base a qualification for a TV host based on their TV resume, based on what they've accomplished through TV ranks, then I would say I'm the most qualified. The now, like, most day one? For the stop. But not, let's get back to football. Come on, man. This guy's been in this game stuck, as you said, at the coordinator position on television, <laughs> car washing all day. And they've been in the game way longer than you. Be real. You fast people. I tell I know these people. They mad at you here. They always text me, when you going to get your boy off? I'm like, no, nah, I ain't. He passed you. Let, let's get it's back to football. Good. Let's get back to football. Okay. If you want to base your qualifications on offensive resumes, I still don't think Sirianni is. Because I would talk about Brian Dable and how what he did for the Chiefs. Nice. I would talk about the enemy. What he's done for uh, Brian Dable, what he did for the Bills. Yeah. The enemy, what he did for the Chiefs. I would talk about Agreed. even more prolific offenses. Agreed. But. If you want to base qualifications upon who you can manipulate the most, then yes, Nick Sirianni is the most qualified. Well, I, I'm just yeah. judging your qualification being who you can man manipulate, yeah. like I judge TV shows yeah. who only hire based on gold jackets, but they can't do a job. <sighs> oh! Now we're in the same place. Let's get there. Everybody is looking at it differently. We all are choosing our door to go to the same place. But the door that they chose, you can't be mad at because they advertised the door that they were going to choose. Next coach ain't going to be Doug Peterson. Next coach ain't going to be coming up here upstairs talking about what he going to do and what he's not going to do. Next coach is going to be able to relate to our 
franchise quarterback if he's still that guy because of the investment we have in him. Next coach is going to know this building but not think he controls and owns what's in this building. All of that said, man, a lot of arrows start to point. And then if you look at the resume, calling plays or not, you're the offensive coordinator. Mm -hmm. 30th to 8th, 31st to 14th, last to 2nd. Mm, starting to sound pretty to good Let's to me. Let's get to the why. Because the why? if you want to talk about frustration, let's get to the why I am frustrated. Yes! The I'm why sure. I am frustrated is because of this. I don't think organizations succeed when a coach and management are not on the same page. Okay. I just don't think they succeed. I was in Philadelphia with Chip Kelly. And based on what I was told by coaches on that staff at the time, Chip had to hire certain coaches at certain positions, and then he could hire whoever else he wanted. Oh, but he had thanks. to hire certain coaches at certain positions. Now, Chip and management didn't really get along, which is why the general manager at the time, Howie Roseman, was thrown to the other side of the building when Chip was calling the shots. Mm. Then as soon as Chip got fired, Howie was thrown back to the football lop side of the building. I don't think that the Eagles can succeed if you have a general manager who wants to call it one way and a head coach who's trying to coach it the other way. Yeah, early on, it'll sound nice, it'll be great, but Nick Sirianni probably running to take that job because just three years ago <laughs> you, you were a receivers coach and now you a head coach. Yeah. But just because you're running at an opportunity doesn't mean it'll be great for you when you get it. I love you, big dog. But um, I was here in L.A. doing um, a TV show and local L.A. radio. So yes, Lakers, Dodgers, Chargers, Rams. I remember day one of Sean McVay. Now, I remember people like, He's offensive coordinator in Washington. But, 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 but. And then you're like, oh, listen to this guy. Oh, let's watch. Oh, look at the impact. Look at Jared Goff. All that. And if you look at Sean McVay's resume as an offensive coordinator, not certain if he was calling plays or not, but knowing Sean McVay probably was, he didn't even have the same amount of impact in Washington as Nick Sirianni did in, in Indianapolis with the coach. All that said, big dog, man, we both have benefited from a little tailwind behind us that maybe we didn't fully qualify for, but now we're living it up and owning it. We'll see you. Good luck, Nick. Coming up, Tom Brady is no stranger to championship weekend, but we'll tell you if he's under any pressure on Sunday. That's next. Speak for yourself. What's up, Speak for Yourself listeners? It's your boy, Shay Sharp, co-host of FS1's Undisputed. I wanted to tell you about my new podcast, Club Shay Shay, where we always do something before to something. Each week, I sit down with a guest for a drink and conversation, and as host and proprietor of Club Shay Shay, I welcome in esteemed guests such as Snoop Dogg, Floyd Money Mayweather, LeVar Ball, Isaiah Thomas, just to mention a few. Whether I'm talking to an athlete, a musician, an actor, or a lifelong friend, Club Shay Shay is a place where people share inspiring and motivational stories about their journeys to prominence. The new episode drops every Monday on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Subscribe to Club Shay Shay now and make sure you never miss a new episode. Now, back to Speak for Yourself. Welcome back to Speak for Yourself. Tom Brady is set to meet Aaron Rodgers for the first time in the playoffs in Sunday's Ooh. NFC Championship game on Fox. It's Brady's 14th trip to the conference title game, but his first in the NFC. Brady added to his stacked resume this year by leading the Bucks to their best season since 2002. What's up, Tom Brady? Mm. Marcellus, let's talk about it. Mm. Uh, how much pressure is Tom Brady on this Sunday? <laughs> no pressure, man. In terms of legacy, I think we're trying to like imply that in this conversation like Tom Brady people don't understand his greatness because they say it so fast and move on to the next conversation <laughs> I was like wait 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 did you just say the most decorated football player ever at any position think about it. all right how we get to work every day you drive you watch the Bentley lately it's, it's washed up it's clean it's, it's sparkling <laughs> the top down it's been nice weather anyway I know that you ride a Bentley I see it all the time dusty um <laughs> I think they're dusty. Um, but I love it. I love it. You, you're clean. You're winning. You're doing what I wish I could be doing, but I'm stuck. I got kids and wife. I'm at home. And I watch Acho show up every day. But you know what? If you ever just look to the left and look to the right, there are football fields. And there are football players all across America mm -hmm. trying to do what Tom Brady does. Still. Since 2000, he's still doing it. And guess what? Of all the football players you have ever come across in your life, all of us, Adam, all of everybody, hold hands across America. We are the world. You know who's number one in terms of number one in terms of accolade and in terms of resume? Tom Brady. 
What pressure? This is just more gravy on a resume that is just full of greatness. It, it, it's almost like Tom Brady is looking at this situation like there's only one person that keeps popping up. They keep giving him these accolades. And it's not necessarily GOAT, but it's things to build him up into a GOAT conversation. Most talented quarterback, <laughs> most skilled arm, most skilled thrower ever. Wait a minute, what are all these subcategories y'all trying to give <laughs> sub GOATs? So this is Tom Brady at the picnic, all the gravy on his resume, sitting there eating a sandwich. And here comes a gnat. <laughs> Damn, Aaron. Okay, okay. All right, he's still eating. Right, right. Here comes that fly again, the fly on the goat. Damn, Aaron. And you know what's funny about that scenario? Would you ever stop eating? No. You're just a little irritated by it, but you're going to still gnaw through that sandwich. This is Tom Brady. He just gnawed through Drew Brees. He's about to gnaw through Aaron Rodgers on the way to solidify once again. Unfortunately, he has to keep solidifying it. Goat status. I like your take. You I can't lie, real. I like your take. You know it's real. Um, but I think that Tom Brady's under a bunch of pressure. I know, actually, Tom Brady's under a lot of pressure. Marcellus, oh. we got to be real. Aaron Rodgers is more than a gnat. We know that. And, and, and yeah. I think even beyond that, as long as you were on the throne, you got to stay on the throne. Preach. One of the biggest arguments in favor of Michael, John, Michael Jordan being the greatest of all time. I don't adhere to this argument, but it's one of the biggest arguments nonetheless. Mm. Nobody ever won chips on Michael Jordan's watch. Mm. We hear that all the time. Yeah, nobody ever won chips nobody. on his watch. In his prime is what they're implying, but nobody won a chip on his watch. Tom Brady, you just knocked Drew Brees out. So Drew Brees ain't really, really winning on your watch. Now you about to come over here with Aaron Rodgers. Mm. And contrary to common belief, we know Aaron Rodgers is more than a gnat. Be real. Your Aaron Rodgers teammate receiver this year, this week, yesterday, just said, I think Aaron Rodgers is a GOAT. We've come on this show. I think you and LeVar, I probably jumped in myself and said Aaron Rodgers is a more talented quarterback based on skill than Tom Brady. So Tom Brady's under pressure because as long as you were on the throne, as long as you're wearing a crown, you mm. got to stay on the throne. How can you do that? By beating the Packers on Sunday. If you lose to the Packers, people are going to start whittling away. Oh, well, well, remember the last time we saw Aaron Rodgers and Tom Brady go head to head, Aaron Rodgers beat him to win a Super Bowl. In five, ten years, when we're analyzing and assessing resumes, ah, well, you know, Aaron Rodgers got him when it counted. Aaron Rodgers forced him into retirement. We're going to hear that type of jargon. So mm. Tom Brady understands the pressure first off from that perspective but there are other perspectives we can get into yeah uh let's bring in fox nfl analyst greg jennings a man that played one with aaron Rodgers. so greg how much pressure is tom brady the man aaron Rodgers is going up against how much pressure is he under sunday um i think he's under whatever pressure he decides to put on himself <laughs> which is always quite a bit and, and let me let me break that down when you talk to tom brady he doesn't go straight to the big picture like we all do. He doesn't because he he allows himself or he doesn't allow himself to see all those championships and what he yeah. brings to the table as far as winnings. He sees what's in front of him and what's in front of him is what he can control at his position. So the pressure that Tom Brady is putting on himself is to see that he can play this game for three hours at the highest of his ability and he can get his teammates to match that same intensity and that same output. And if they do that, then they win. That is the type of pressure he puts on himself. It's not so much about, can I carry this team over the hump? Unfortunately, that's the pressure that he, he's in, though, because of who he is. It's like LeBron James. In the East, everybody talked about LeBron James and his path to the championship, to the finals, how easy it was. And in the West, it was so difficult. And if he goes out West, it'll yeah. be so hard. He goes out West, and the expectation never changed. Even though we say the competition did, the expectation didn't change. His approach never changed. His understanding went to another level as well. That's the same with Tom Brady. Coming over to the NFC, he knows what the expectations are. But he also understands I can't get outside of myself and start trying to check the box of what others' expectations are if I don't do the little things that has always been most important for me to be successful. And then if I'm successful as Tom Brady, 
the team then has success. That's the type of pressure that he puts on himself. So I don't see him caring about the pressure of knowing that this is a must win because they have together and they've assembled the personnel of a team that's a win now situation. He doesn't even see it as that. He understands that, but he's like, well, I'm going to take it one day at a time. And if we can put together great intentional practices, then we can do that for a game because we're out here for more time as an offense than we are ever on the field during a regular season game or a postseason game. So that's the type of pressure Tom Brady has on himself right now. Yeah. And look, goodness, man, sometimes you get put in an impossible position. I know you, Greg, you had tremendous success with Aaron Rodgers. And obviously, Tom Brady uh, is a nemesis to all who played. How about this? Great players were drafted after Tom Brady was in the league and retired <laughs> before Tom Brady has departed this same league. His offensive coordinator, Byron Leftwich, my boy, my former teammate, drafted after mm. Tom Brady. Retired with a good career and is now the offensive coordinator of that same Tom Brady. This is insane if you really want to just say it like it is. If you want to really keep perspective. In this GOAT conversation, no one compares to Tom Brady. Now, if we want to have a skills competition, oh, a lot of people compare. Matter of fact, some people surpass Tom Brady in my eyes. But I'm not having that conversation right now. I'm having a pressure conversation on the GOAT in this situation. Don't forget, guys, that Tom Brady with his six rings and maybe counting has two more, two more already than Joe Montana. And Terry Bradshaw for those out there who got a chance to see uh, Terry Bradshaw play and his greatness. That two more than the next guy. And then we don't even get down to Aaron Rodgers. We get to Troy Aikman at the next level. Then we don't even get to Aaron Rodgers. We get to eight other quarterbacks at the next level of two Super Bowl rings. Then you go down another tier and there goes Aaron Rodgers, that gnat. <laughs> now, I know he's a tremendous football player, but when you have accolades like this and your name is Tom Brady, twice as many playoff wins as any other quarterback in NFL history, and already four more Super Bowl appearances than any other quarterback in Super Bowl history, man, ah, the pressure on him, I guess like Greg said it, and he said it best, is only the pressure he applies on himself. That's true, and I think, Greg, you're right. I think, Sal, you're right, and I'm going to offer this last tidbit. Crazy. Remember, a, a team has never hosted the Super Bowl in that same city that they play. True. Meaning, so if the Tampa Bay Bucks understand the Super Bowl's in Tampa this year, you can already smell it. The reason I think there's a ton of pressure for Tom Brady is because of that idiomatic phrase, don't snatch defeat from the jaws of victory. Mm. Like, the Buccaneers are close now. Mm. Best record, best success they've had since 2 The fans can taste it. Bruce Arians, let's not front. He just said a couple <laughs> weeks ago, it's Super Bowl or bust. Everybody can taste it. They're looking at you, Tom Brady. This is what he came here for. We're just one game away. We're close. We're about to do it. Tom Brady knows that. But more than anything, Tom Brady knows all eyes in the locker room are looking at him. All eyes in the stadium and outside of the stadium are looking at him saying, look, Tom Brady, this is you. This is what you came here for. Mm. You're the greatest of all time. Mm. The greatest of all time. Find a way to get it done. Whether you want to consciously acknowledge that pre pressure, you will subliminally feel that pressure. I, I, can I say this, though? Please. I mean, we've all been in positions where we had pressure on us, and we accomplished. We, we were victorious in that pressure-filled situation, in part why we're here right now, because we are survivors and thrivers in pressure situations. But we ain't Tom Brady, bro. <laughs> I mean, I mean, he can't be, I, mean I, I always look in the mirror and be like, I'm all right, but somebody got me up here and somebody got me down here. And there's a lot more under me. But still, I got to keep it real. He can become the first player ever to go to 10 Super Bowls. Insane. And the first quarterback to go to the Super Bowl in the NFC and AFC. Man, this dude is built for this. And Aaron Rodgers understands that as well. Good luck to both of those guys. Coming up, Patrick Mahomes practice for the second straight day. We'll tell you if we have any concerns about the Chiefs quarterback. That's next. Speak for yourself. Hey, Speak for Yourself listeners. It's Charlotte Wilder here to tell you about my new podcast with Mark Titus called The People's Sports Podcast. It comes out every Thursday, and Mark and I take one of the big stories of the week, and then we go off on tangents you never saw coming. This might mean that we start talking about the Dodgers winning the World Series and end up wondering if Knicks fans deserve happiness or begin with LeBron's greatness and end up drafting our ultimate beer league softball team made up of old athletes. 
whatever it is. The only rule of the show is that it has to be fun and funny because these days we can all use as many laughs as we can get. So check it out wherever you get your podcasts and come down weird sports rabbit holes with us. We can't wait to have you. Now, back to Speak for Yourself. Welcome back to Speak for Yourself. All eyes are on Patrick Mahomes' status leading up to Sunday's AFC Championship game against the Bills. All eyes on me. Andy Reid said yesterday that his quarterback, quote, look good, but is still in concussion protocol. Today, there were positive signs for KC as Mahomes practiced for the second straight day, and more importantly, with a helmet on. <laughs> so, Acho, you have any concerns for Patrick Mahomes on Sunday? Nah, big dog. Nah. I mean, I know in theory we should. Nah, I ain't got none. And I don't have any because of what Patrick Mahomes has shown me. I got to be honest with you. Mm. Patrick Mahomes, 24 wins in his last 25 games. I ain't got concerns over that. Mm. Patrick Mahomes, you got Andy Reid as your head coach. Eric Bieniemy as your OC. You got Travis Kelsey, Tyree Kill, Miko <laughs> Hardman. I ain't got no concerns Goodness, for that. Goodness, hard enough. You, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> Block I, over. I ain't got no concerns Damn, for that. video but game. If nothing else, let's look at the other times Oof. Patrick Mahomes has had to take breaks from ball. Okay. Whether bye weeks, whether injuries, whatever the case may whatever be. It is. He had to take a break from ball week 10 of 2019. Remember, he got hurt, mm -hmm. came back against the Titans, came back three touchdowns, no pick, 72% completion percentage. Dude, then boy. he had to take a break from ball before that Texans playoff game, five touchdowns, no interceptions. Then he had to take a break from ball again before the Browns game, two touchdowns, no interceptions, one rushing, run passing. So when I look at Patrick Mahomes and having to take his breaks from ball, if you will, I see three touchdowns, no picks, five touchdowns, no picks, two touchdowns, and two quarters, no picks. Patrick Mahomes is so good at playing this position. Mm. Andy Reid, Eric Bieniemy are so good at preparing him on Sundays. And then he has such a plethora of talent out there that I just don't see how I can have concerns about Mahomes because he's never given me a reason to have a concern prior. Okay. Um, I can't walk into any ball game. And I've never walked into any ball game since Pop Warner with zero concerns for the other team or zero concerns whether I was the favorite or I was the underdog. It's always a concern. Like football, <laughs> I mean, it's warfare out there for us, brother. It's, it's, it's hell to pay every time you go out there. Look at Patrick Mahomes' last game. If he would have walked out there with zero concerns, he didn't walk out with zero he concerns. He walked in with no <laughs> concerns. He walked out with several. Right, right, including where am I? Like, so let's just be real about that. I, I am concerned about him. Um, he's compromised right now. Uh, whatever you want to say about the concussion, the neck injury, the nerve injury, uh, his, his foot, his toe injury, whatever you want to say, he's not at full strength. But I guess you can feel better because no one is at full strength True. this time True. in the playoffs. But that said, he's facing a team, at least defensively, that feels like they're at full strength. And that's the Buffalo Bills and that defense of the four Remaining defenses, they're the best in terms of scoring defense, only allowing 13 and a half points a game. Think about it. They faced the Indianapolis coach team with a tremendous offensive coordinator named Nick Sirianni. <laughs> <laughs> <And> uh, <laughs> I mean, I've never said that together before today. Um, but 472 yards of total offense, zero turnovers, and the Buffalo Bills still win that game, gave up 24 points. Next time, they go out there, they see the Baltimore Ravens only give up three points to one of the hottest teams in football. Hey, the Bills not playing any games on the defensive side, but let's talk about Patrick Mahomes. And this is a stat, this is a line that is, it should be disturbing. Only Drew Brees had a bigger drop off from the beginning of the year to the end of the year in terms of passer rating. Okay. Only Drew Brees. So if you look at Patrick Mahomes and try to like give him trimesters, you know what I'm saying? Remember we had semesters and these kids start coming up with, oh no, I got thirds of a year. Okay, whatever. Week one through week 12, Patrick Mahomes was Patrick Mahomes. Yep. Week 13 all the way to last week, or at least to the half, uh, that wasn't Patrick Mahomes. Then you saw him in the Cleveland game for a half, and you're like, kind of Patrick Mahomes, almost there, but not fully Patrick Mahomes. The point is, if you're going to ride that roller coaster ride, if you're Patrick Mahomes and you're going against a defense as stout as the Buffalo Bills, it might be something of concern. Yeah, there's, there, there might be a little, a little. bit reason. I understand yeah. why you would yeah. say that. But even if Patrick Mahomes isn't at 100%, what we know is that He's so much better, we might not even be able to see it or feel it. That's fact. Think about it. Patrick That's Mahomes, 5-1 and one in his career in the playoffs, in his short career in the playoffs. Only quarterback in NFL history to average over 30 points a game in the playoffs. His team averages 33 and a half mm. uh, with a minimum of five starts. So Patrick Mahomes, even if he's a little long, even if he struggles a little bit, we really going to be able to tell? Because I think against the Browns, he was hobbled. 
but he still gave us two touchdowns with no uh, no <laughs> interceptions That's before him. he left the game. Yeah. Even when he came back against the Titans week 10 last year, 2019, two years ago, I guess, by calendars, he was still a little hobbled with that ankle, with that knee, whatever it may have been, that lower body injury. Still gave us three touchdowns. I think it was 470 yards, if I'm not mistaken. Mm. So imagine what he could have done healthy. You hit the nail on the head when you said everybody at this junction is timing. Everybody. Everybody. Beat everybody. Down. Like, you've played at this point where there was no preseason, but at this point, you've played about five months of ball. Five mm. months of ball, about 18, 19 weeks of football. Mm. When you're physically tired of being there. Let's Done. be real. Done. You've been there. I've been there once. I went to the playoffs one time. You're physically exhausted. You're mentally you know. exhausted. So everybody tired. Mm -hmm. Even if Patrick Mahomes isn't 100%, I don't think we'll notice. Yeah, but you, you have to notice because this is what happens. Every round of the playoffs, obviously, the competition gets stiffer. So even if you want to stay the same, they are not. <laughs> the Buffalo Bills will not be the Cleveland Browns for whatever reason you want to identify. Here's the thing, big dog. Chiefs have now scored fewer than 28 points in five of their last seven games. The Chiefs? Are you kidding me? Matter of fact, if you want to take out the Week 17 tap out by Patrick Mahomes, because he's Patrick Mahomes, he doesn't have to play that game. The 71 points they scored in those last three starts, second fewest in any three-game span for Patrick Mahomes in his career. I mean, you got to dive into these details, as Acho loves to tell me, and now, you know what? I believe you. It's not what have you done. It's what have you done for me lately. And lately, Patrick Mahomes, like his body is telling him, is just a little compromised. We'll see how it plays out. Coming up. Kyrie Irving is back, but the Nets still lost to the Cavs. We'll tell you if it's something or nothing. Nets, speak for yourself. You watch to speak for yourself. Marcel Swally, Emmanuel Acho in the building. Let's get to the NBA. Well, Kyrie Irving was back in the Nets lineup last night after missing seven games. Brooklyn's big three of Kyrie, KD, James Harden combined for nearly 100 points. But it was not enough. Colin Sexton dropped 42 points, including 15 in the second overtime for the win. The Nets took the L, but I was wondering, hey, Kyrie, how was your first game back, big dog? Honestly, too long. <laughs> the two OTs for the first game back. Man, hey, you got to love, you got to love NBA basketball, bro. You know, we're still early in this process. It's only game one for all of us, so uh, we got a long way to go, but um, we're still excited about you know, everything that's going on. This journey together is going to be fun. You know, it was a tough first start, and especially it was an up and down game for us. But, you know, I, I like I like where we are. Mm, Harden finally got to wear that bomber he bought his rookie <laughs> year in OKC again. All right, we're joined now by Fox NBA analyst Slick Rick the Buker. Hey. But Acho, is the Nets loss to the Cavs something or nada? Uh, it's absolutely something. And the reason it's something is it's confirming all the doubts and the questions uh, that we true. already had. See, Cell, what did we say about these Nets? What were our worries? What were our concerns? We thought that, wait a second, will they really mesh? Like, who's going to take the shots? Where are Kyrie's shots going to come from? Mm. All of a sudden, Kyrie, 28 shots. KD, 25. James Harden, 14. This is the same James Harden that in his first two starts in the debut with the new team. Fifth all-time in NBA history with most points in your first two starts with a new team. That same James Harden? Took half as many shots as Kyrie. Okay, what else were we concerned about? We were concerned about the Nets' inability to play defense. And the Cavs, which have the worst offense in the league, scored the most points in the league. So the two things <laughs> that we were primarily concerned about with this Nets team were confirmed for us on day one. Yeah. Had the Nets lost in a slugfest, you know, 83 to 67, just an ugly game, I would have tossed that out the window. I would have been like, Marcellus is nothing. I ain't reading into that. Had the Nets lost, you know, 99 to 101, a buzzer beater last second by Sexton, as nothing, it happens, not a big deal. But the Nets lost in the exact manner that we predicted they might struggle with because mm. of this combination. Mm. Now, I'm not going to act like the sky is falling. You lost a regular season game in January. But what are the indications of what that loss means long term? And that's why I think it's something. Oh, you know me. I don't think anything of this. This is nothing. How about negative nothing? Is that a thing? Less than nothing. I mean, what the hell are 
are we doing right here, guys? One, if you watched the game yesterday, like we all didn't, um, it was a slugfest. <laughs> no, watching the game, it was a slugfest. Brooklyn comes out in the first quarter up double digits. Like, all of a sudden, they took the foot off the gas. Like, these dudes is crumbs. Even though Cleveland is not crumbs necessarily, and I get into that. So, is this a slugfest? Acho, I love you, big dog. At the end of regular time, we're tied. At the end of the first overtime, guess what? We're tied again. And then finally, yo, I'm tired, boss. <laughs> and Sexton went off and obviously goes four for four in the second overtime, and they win that game. I think what happens in this situation is everyone, like Acho was doing, is doing the confirmation bias because there's only two sides you can look at this as. The side I'm on, which is like, yo, they have so much firepower that there's no way that this can go wrong. Or the side that Acho's on, which is basically, how's this going to work out? Because you already see who gets the shots, who's deferring, et cetera, et cetera. But let me remind you guys, one, their opponent last night, the Cleveland Cavaliers, they're a 500 bunch. They're scrappy. They're not losers. They're a 500 team that has also beat the best team in the NBA this year, by record, the Philadelphia 76ers, by 24 points in regular time. Whoa, you didn't see that one coming. So, one, why are y'all so upset at the Cleveland Cavaliers doing what they do, which is beat up the big dogs in their conference right now? But two, didn't I witness last year the champion Los Angeles Lakers in their first outing together lose to my Clippers? Yes. And how did that turn out? Obviously, well, because they became champions. So for me, this is nothing by just perspective, by the near history of the Los Angeles Lakers turning around from day one, and by the fact that they didn't lose to some bums. They lost to some dudes that smoked the best team by record. It is something because the last time I checked, this is not Seinfeld. We only talk about things mm. that are something. Mm. We don't talk oh, about point, nothing. Mm. And the optics in and of themselves are bad because it's not that they lost. It's that they lost after James Harden and Kevin Durant found a way to beat the Milwaukee Bucks mm. and mm. the reigning MVP Giannis Antetokounmpo mm. and then turn around add Kyrie Irving to the <laughs> equation, and lose to, as Acho said, the worst offensive team in the league. Mm -hmm. And the 22nd best team shooting the three went 20 for 40. It's also the fact that so many other things went right. The big three actually played well together. <laughs> They shared the ball, 30 assists. Mm -hmm. They got the supporting cast involved. They won the rebounding battle. And I know, Marcellus, that you've said before, defense doesn't matter to you. The problem is <laughs> it does not appear to matter to James Harden, Kyrie Irving, and Kevin Durant Definitely. either because ultimately that's what cost them this game and that's what we said was going to be a potential problem, that no matter how good they were offensively, that their defense wasn't going to be good enough to compensate. Yeah, Slick, man. You, you, you went everywhere right there, and Slick, mm. everywhere you went was right. Um, it, it's something because Colin Sexton went out there and cooked on everybody's cell? Everybody. Uh, on Kyrie, he went six for ten. Oh, y'all. On James Harden, he went four for four. On KD, he went two for three. Kyrie, I don't care how many buckets you get. If the dude you guarding gets more buckets than you, you still <laughs> fighting a losing battle. Harden, I don't care how many buckets you get. If the dude you guarding gets more buckets than you. But I actually watched that game last night because I was really intentional on what's up with these nets. I can't come up here and Key. talk about it yeah. if I don't watch. Yeah. Slick and sell. This is when I was like, uh-oh, there might be a problem. Let's go back to the last two possessions of regulation. Hmm. The second to last offensive possession for the nets of regulation. I don't know if y'all recall. James Harden didn't pass the ball. Straight iso ball, iso ball, James Harden shot. Last possession of regulation, I don't know if y'all recall, Kyrie didn't pass the ball. He gets the ball, five seconds left, KD like, ball, 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 ball. And Kyrie, dribble, 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 shot. I'm looking at this game like, uh-oh, hold on now. The two most pivotal possessions in the game ended, so you ain't got to go to OT. The best player on the team 
doesn't get the ball. That's Kevin Durant. And there is absolutely no ball movement. We can excuse the last possession, if you will. Five seconds left, a little bit of scramble, a little bit of chaos. But the second to last possession can't excuse. The last reason I'm going to say second lap I got issue with it is this. Kyrie, you're an incredibly talented player. One of the most talented players in the league. Mm. You're the third best player on your team. So why, after two weeks of an absence, being the third player, third best player on your team, are you taking the most shots on your team? See, Kevin Durant has an NBA MVP award. James Harden has an NBA MVP award. So how are you out shooting KD in your first game back? And how are you taking <laughs> twice as many shots as Harden in your first game back? And also, I don't like reading too, many, too much into things, Slick, but I know you do, so I'm going to do it. <laughs> I'm going to ride with you, Slick. I don't know if y'all saw the pros game presser. Who was the only player smiling after that loss? It wasn't KD. It wasn't Harden. It was Kyrie. Kyrie mm. smiling after y'all lost because Kyrie got his sale. He got his buckets. KD done already got his in his career. He's trying to win. And James Harden is like, I only took 14 shots and I've been balling. I'm going to make a small issue out of it because eventually mm. that molehill is going to become a mountain. You watch. Do you? Acho, there's another element that you pointed up here that I was going to uh, bring up, but you added a piece to it, which is it's not just about the big three. The, the shot selection at the end of the game and where they were going also points the spotlight on the coaching staff mm. and what they were and how they were informing this team. The other element was that those big three played the last 18 minutes without a break. They were on the floor for yeah. 18 consecutive minutes. That points up that this is all new to Steve Nash and that he may be leaning too hard on Mike D'Antoni's methodology when it comes to riding his stars and not worrying about minutes. Like Kyrie was just coming back from this layoff. It's early in the season, and you're playing those guys that many consecutive minutes, and they looked gassed at the end. I don't know they would have made a difference with their defense. So that's another element here that we have to consider that makes this something, is that this game pointed up that Steve Nash is new to this, and that's going to be an element. And besides, it has to be something, Marcellus. Uh, speak for yourself and that you didn't watch the game. That's the name of the show, right? Because <laughs> when else would we watch? Look, Acho and I, we're not watching Cavs versus Nets at this point <laughs> in the season. Acho is. Unless it meant something. Yeah, well, Acho dating them old ladies, so you know they tap out early. So <laughs> Acho watched not only the game, the post-game presser. Boy, I tell you, you better date somebody your age and stay up with you. <laughs> Watch Lupin or something. That's a good series. All right, here's the thing. You guys going to be on the wrong side of history again because oh. I know my boy Acho. And I remember coming up on this show, what was it, early September in week one when I saw the Tampa Bay Bucks play the New Orleans Saints. And Acho had the the same exact arguments, but it was in a different sport. It was in football. He's like, they have too many weapons. How are they all going to be happy? The Eagles on that team, how is it going to work? Saints said, smack. Acho said, see, I told you. Confirmation bias. And then week nine, it happens again. Acho said, see, I told you, told you, told you. And I'm like, Acho, they are playing together for a different destination, for a different date than even the Saints. And how did that work out? Y'all gonna be on the wrong side of history again? Okay, do it. Here's the thing. This reminds me of like the Miami Heat big three. Y'all remember how they started off in year one? Eight and seven. And the sky was falling because LeBron was there at pep rallies and everybody was like, oh my God, y'all are barely over 500. How did that turn out? They went to the finals, then they lost in the finals. But hey, if the Brooklyn Nets lose in the finals, I would still deem this a success. That said... You got to understand, I can't juggle, but I can throw two balls in the air, KD and James Harden, and just swap them up in the ball. All right. But add a third ball. It's going to take me a second. I'm going to say, whoa, the third ball. And then all of a sudden, you start to get into the seat. You start to get into a pattern. That's what's happening with this team. And let's not exaggerate how bad they are defensively now. Because, Slick, you are a great basketball analyst. They were horrible before. They, now they don't have Jared Allen in terms of a rim protector. Yeah. And guess yeah. what? Yeah, they have open roster spots that they could designate for defenders only, exclusively defense. So look at it in totality, man. This thing's going to be just like the Tampa Bay Bucks, and I'm going to be laughing last. Coming up, Josh Allen is the MVP candidate this season, but we'll tell you if he has more at stake on Sunday than Patrick Mahomes. Next, speak for yourself. 
Welcome back to Speak. The Chiefs are favored by three points Sunday against the Bills in the AFC Championship game, according to Fox Bet Sports Book. Now, quarterback Patrick Mahomes is still in concussion protocol, but on a positive note, he practiced today with the helmet on. Josh Allen, the top MVP candidate, but his Bills have not been to the Super Bowl in 27 seasons. NFL analyst Greg Jennings is back with us. Mm. But Marcellus, talk to me. Which quarterback has more at stake, Josh Allen? Patrick Mahomes. Uh, I'm going with Josh Allen here. Uh, you just can't waste opportunities in life. Um, that's just something I'm trying to teach my kids and something that I've learned, and I've learned hard lessons uh, by not having that mindset. Uh, even if it happens early, even if it happens to you before you're fully prepared, take full advantage of it. And if you look at this situation, this is the third straight AFC championship appearance for Patrick Mahomes. Sounds like he's taking full advantage of his opportunities. Josh Allen, it's time to get on that same train, man. You do not want to be on the other train because there's another train following this one, and it's the train that Dan Marino got on in his second season. Uh, Phillip Rivers got on in his second season. Michael Vick tried to get on the NFC Championship game fourth season. Cam Newton, Dante Culpepper, Andrew Luck, etc. Guys who get there early and they're like, oh, you know what? I'm coming back. And that train is a one way. <laughs> it's not coming back. So if you look at a team that is just ready for this moment, the second highest scoring offense in the regular season, Buffalo Bills. The best remaining scoring defense in the playoffs, Buffalo Bills. Versus the Kansas City Chiefs team that is sputtering in terms of what they're playing offensively up to potential. They're not exactly the Chiefs. They're something close to it. And a hobbled, compromised quarterback in Patrick Mahomes. Oh, man, you got to be licking your chops. You're at full strength. You're a 13-win team. And you're going against a team that their quarterback, who is all-world, just got knocked out of a game. I don't know if there's a more prime opportunity than this one, and you better take advantage of it. Man, I think Patrick Mahomes has more at stake. And Patrick Mahomes has more at stake for this reason. You got to keep those that are beneath you, beneath you. Mm. <laughs> Tom Brady, Peyton Manning, their whole career, what they do to Phillip Rivers, they said, hey, you're going to stay beneath us in the AFC. Done deal. We're done with it. Montana, what did he do to Elway? Hey, you're going to stay beneath me. You can win chips when I'm done. You can win a Super Bowl when I'm gone, mm. but while I'm here, you're not going to get above me. Patrick Mahomes, you've already, already separated yourself from the pack of young quarterbacks. Lamar Jackson is great. Patrick Mahomes, you are better. Josh Allen is having a flash of greatness. Patrick Mahomes, you are better. Keep those that are beneath you beneath you. That's what's at stake. But then the other thing is, as early in Patrick Mahomes' career as we currently are, he's already in GOAT conversations. Already! Yeah. In yeah. GOAT conversations. Well, to be in GOAT conversations, you got to do GOAT things. Back-to-back -back Super Bowls. Tom Brady's done that. 03, 04. He's the last person to do that. Prior to that was John Elway. Patrick Mahomes, you can be the first quarterback in 17 years to win back-to-back -back Super Bowls. That's a GOAT thing. You in GOAT conversations, solidify those conversations. You're, in, you're the young best quarterback. The best quarterback based on age right now. Keep Josh Allen, who's already beneath you, beneath you, and handle business. More at stake for Mahomes. Yes, yeah, Steph, I agree with you, Acho. I, I like your take, though, Marcellus. Uh, but it is Patrick Mahomes for those reasons. And when I look at, you know, my experiences, Marcellus, you like to talk about personal experiences. I look mm -hmm. at my experiences when I was with the Green Bay Packers and the window of opportunity that we had when we had the team and the personnel together. We thought that window was going to remain open. And it just wasn't the case. And it closes quicker than you think. And when I look at the Kansas mm -hmm. City Chiefs, they are crowned already. They, so that means if you're sitting on top, if you are the king, if your team is the best in the business, you have more to lose because you will be dethroned. And so somebody mm. else then takes that place. So you definitely, at the Kansas City Chiefs and Patrick Mahomes has more to lose. But even more than that, there's no promise that this personnel grouping that they have right now can stay together longer, even past next year or the year after. So their window of opportunity, even though Patrick Mahomes will be there, it's not always promised. And it doesn't look as good as it once did when you're doing it in the current moment. So Patrick Mahomes definitely, in my opinion, has more at stake. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. I'm not against your takes. Um, but what did they say, man? It's worse 
to to have it and lose it than it is to never have it at all. And I used to always look at people like, shoot, I ain't never had it. So it feels worse to me. I want at least a taste of it. And that's a stake. That's a pressure on you. I want a taste of it. You already had it, Patrick Mahomes, and you know what it's like. And that's a better team as well. But if you're looking at Josh Allen and his teammates, Derek, there's an impossible imagination. There's an impossible imagination that this team could be better next year. Like, you just, it may happen, but right now you're like, yo, we 13 and 3. Josh Allen balled out. Hey, guys, we got a great defense. Oh, man, look with Stephon Diggs this year. Like, oh, if we don't do it now, when are we going to ever do it? And the Chiefs are not going anywhere. So we got to get them right now, especially when the quarterback just got hurt. My last take is isn't it crazy how. This three plus one invite just got served around the last few years. Uh, three great quarterbacks, whatever you want to say. And then the other one this year is Josh Allen. Uh, we saw it was Ryan Tannehill. Remember those? And Jimmy G even in that situation. It's a carousel of who else is going to get up there with Brady and Rodgers and Mahomes, right? Well, Josh Allen, you want your name to stay on that invite next year? You better <laughs> handle your business this weekend. Coming up, Greg knows a lot about playing at Lambeau Field. We'll tell you if the Packers' home field advantage will matter on Sunday. Next, speak for yourself. The NFL playoffs continue Sunday with the NFC Championship presented by TurboTax Live as Tom Brady and the Buccaneers take on Aaron Rodgers and the Packers. I'm so hyped. Pre-game coverage starts at 1 p.m. Eastern on Fox and the Fox Sports app. Speaking of that game, Aaron Rodgers is playing in his fifth NFC Championship game Sunday against the Bucs. But it's first at Lambeau Field. There are currently chances of snow. Let it snow, let it snow, let it snow. And the weather is expected to be in the 20s. But Bruce Arians said it would not affect the game, adding, quote, I really don't consider 28 degrees cold. Mm, okay. <laughs> okay. Greg, you know Lambeau Field very, very well. Will the Packers having home field advantage matter on Sunday? Yes, it matters. It definitely matters. When we saw, when we saw those highlights right there of those, that, that Packer team practicing, <laughs> we saw those players out there in their jerseys and helmets and shoulder pads. We saw the coaches in what? Look at the coach. How does the coach dress? <laughs> so Run when up. I listen to coaches like Bruce Arian say, oh, yeah, it won't matter. Yeah, because you're going to be dressed like that. <laughs> <laughs> but the other guys won't. No. But it, it matters especially when you have the advantage of playing in that right now. Like, they're practicing in that today. That's that's their environment. That's their habitat. Mm. And so when you look at habitat. Aaron Rodgers and the way he throws the ball and the way that he spoke of needing to get one of these in Lambeau, an NFC championship, because he understands the importance of the advantage, let alone the fans. And I get it. They're not going to have the full house as they normally would have. But you better believe Lambeau Field mm. around Lambeau Field will be packed. Mm -hmm. Everyone will be out there to support this team. And Aaron Rodgers in that cold climate, this is where he lives. This is where he thrives. It's his domain. And I get it. Tom Brady has played in New England. And he understands what he's going up against. But this team has wanted this for so long, and, and specifically their quarterback. So it's definitely an advantage for the Green Bay Packers. Yo, it definitely matters. I love the perspectives you're about to get during this next quick conversation. G, I think you were born up north and then obviously played for the Packers. Sale grew up in Cali, but then you went up north by college and in the pros. Man. And I was born down south and played college down south. So you're getting all three perspectives. Playing in Green Bay matters. Because you feel it hits more, <laughs> it's harder to catch the ball. And let me tell you how Tampa's going to try to simulate this. If Tampa has an indoor facility, more than likely, they're going to go to their indoor facility and crank the thermostat all the way down. Here's the problem. <laughs> thermostat stopped at like 60. <laughs> so you can only simulate how cold it's going to be. But yeah. let me tell you truly why it matters, because... Tom Brady already told us he don't want to go back up to the Northeast. This warm weather feels mm. great. That's the star player, number one. Star player offensively, number two, Mike Evans. Uh, went to college at Texas A&M and then has spent his whole career in Tampa. Okay, star player number three and four, Leonard Fournette, Ronald Jones, both running backs. One went to USC, drafted to Tampa. One went to LSU, drafted to Jacksonville, then moved to Tampa. All of them are used to or desire the warm weather. Whereas you saw the clips. Aaron Rodgers, Devontae Adams, they're just like, yeah, it's 28 degrees. <laughs> to me or somebody from down south, 
28 degrees is cold. I don't care what nobody says. <laughs> that matters, y'all. I got some personal stories if I got time. If you I'm got time? It, oh, let me get but through I, it then. Go ahead, Sam. Okay, I'm going to get through it real fast. Um, I believe he wants to believe that it won't be a factor, <laughs> but it will. Take it from me, the former Buffalo Bill. It certainly will. It's always mind over matter. We say that cliche because we know that cliche is real, except when that matter is freezing snow. Because when you play <laughs> football, think about it. There are, dog, there are always four opponents on a football field. It's your team, it's their team, it's the referees, and it's the elements. And dog, when you go out there, last time I checked, uh, Elias Sports Bureau said the elements are undefeated. They never lose. They always have an effect on you. You don't believe me? Okay, go somewhere where it's blazing hot and don't even move. You start sweating. Uh-huh. Go somewhere where it's freezing cold and don't move. You start shaking. Guess why? Those elements is like, we're winning this game right now. It's a psychological versus a biological reaction. Psychologically, you'd be like, it ain't that cold. I'm good. I'm, I'm straight. But biologically, your blood is like, slow down. Don't pump. <laughs> it's telling your muscles, hey, tighten up, homie. You know what I mean? It's cold out here. So I understand what Bruce Aarons is saying. We're going to fight through with whatever that mentality is. But the real is, you're still going to be cold, boss. Gee, let me <laughs> chime in, and then I want your, 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 your pushback. The other thing is the Packers players, they're more well-equipped for the cold. See, I didn't know tricks of the cold until I got to Cold City. There you <laughs> I got go. to Green Bay. The first time I played in Lambeau was 2014. I was rotating as a starter at the time. All of a sudden, our equipment manager brings out this wetsuit. I'm like, what is a wetsuit? I guess it's what you take when you're swimming or in the water if you're surfing. T gives me a wetsuit. I'm like, huh? I can't, I can't move in this. He cuts the arms off the sleeves, cuts the neck down because it's choking me. Then he hands me some latex gloves. I'm like, hey, hey, hey now. He's like, <laughs> hand me some latex gloves and some Vaseline. I'm really like, hey, now. Uh, hey, He's like, look, took the Vaseline all over your body to insulate yourself, put on the latex glove, then put on your game glove. I put all that on, and all of a sudden I'm like, oh. I'm warm now. Now, I still couldn't really function a move, but I just imagine, Greg, the secrets and tricks that you knew that South, the people in the South had to learn on the fly. Man, I used to always wonder. That's exactly, that's exactly right. We tried any and everything. everything. And, and the beauty of that, what you're talking about, is we had the opportunity throughout the week to yeah. try it to all try. and throughout the regular season to try and test Bingo. everything out. Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, all the way Saturday, game day. Then all of a sudden, Bruce Smith was greasy. I didn't know that until I got to Buffalo. Oh, that's Vaseline, big dog. You ain't slick. <laughs> Terry Bradshaw is up in the Super 6 stakes yet again for the NFC Championship. Last weekend, he gave away his beloved all-new 2021 Ford F-150 to the lucky winner, Terry. Hmm, speaking of that, from Maryland. This weekend, he's giving away his other all-new 2021 Ford F-150 as a guaranteed prize and $500,000 of his own money. One of the questions for the NFC Championship contest is, how many completions will Brady and Rodgers combine for? So, Acho, get us started. What do you think? How many completions? Let me do the math oh in my head. Tom Brady will have oh, 19, God. Rodgers will have 27. Don't say so that. 46. Like that. 46 <laughs> total completions. Uh, I think I did Greg, that. Greg, what you got? <laughs> They'll have 57 total completions. Uh, okay, I'm going to take, what are they like, Price is Right? I say plus one. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going 58 total completions just to win. <laughs> Download the free Fox Super 6 app and make your picks for your shot to win. All you need to do is pick six outcomes in the NFC Championship game. It's completely free to play. Coming up, Uncle Jimmy joins us. He'll reveal the player that's scaring him the most in Championship Weekend. That's next. Speak for your shell. Before we go, Uncle Jimmy joins us. Aaron Rodgers will be in the spotlight on Sunday. But I hear you have something to say about him right now. Get him on. Hey, man. On the for real, for real? Yeah. Aaron Rodgers is one of them white dudes that scares the hell out of me. Right, right. See, y'all think he's cool just because he be hanging out with Jake from State Farm. But my mama said that you can tell a whole lot about a man if you just look at him in his eyes. See, Aaron Rodgers got a look in his eyes like he's always reminiscing about the first time that he ever chopped the head off. The only words that you can say to Aaron Rodgers that can get him rattled is cadaver dog. Hey, man, Aaron Rodgers looks so crazy. And O.J. Simpson reached out to him on Twitter and said, hey, man, I've seen that look before. Look at your face. <laughs> I'm just trying to what say Aaron Rodgers is crazy as hell.
Yeah, you are not. <laughs> I mean, you don't have to look the part for the uncle. The hell? I hope I'm back tomorrow, y'all. Fox Bet Live is next.